Well, hello and welcome to today's webcast. I'm Dave McCormick, the Vice President of Product Management here at Alpha Software. In today's Alpha Anywhere demo and Q&A session, uh, Dion McCormick, no relation, will be going through a quick demo at the very beginning, and more importantly, he'll be here to answer your questions. So go ahead and start by typing those questions into the questions box of the GoToWebinar interface. So let's begin. Dean, I see you're on mute. Let me just take you off mute real quick. Hello, Dean, are you there? Doing great, doing great. How am I coming through? Coming through. Let me go ahead and make you the presenter. Yours is a bit uh, uh, light. A little quiet. Well, hang on. Yeah, it was a little quiet. Just wanted to All let right. you know. Because right, we this? want to hear what you have to say, Dave. Th thanks, Dean. I appreciate it. Not that. now. I mean, earlier. Not now. You know, we don't hear anything. I'm talking. <laughs> okay, good um, enough. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hey, thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy, busy, busy schedule to attend our weekly webinar. Great attendance. Uh, do us a favor. This is about you. Help us help you. And that can be done by going into the Q&A section of your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. And in there is a questions area. Uh, go ahead and type your question in. Dave will be monitoring those closely through our uh, presentation today. And we'll get to as many of those as possible. And we always recommend, if you have an opportunity, you have a question that's burning, to uh, let us know at guides, that's G-U-I-D-E-S, at Alpha Software. Dot com. That's an email that Dave monitors and we get great requests. In fact, today will be the second half of a follow-up of a question in terms of how to do auditing with uh, Alpha, specifically uh, activity auditing, login auditing, etc. And we'll be continuing that discussion today. And we got a great one which is uh, about the new WebSockets technology. So we're going to be starting to work on putting together a nice little demo presentation on that. Probably take a couple sessions to go through. And those are all coming through the fabulous guides at alphasoftware.com. So please, please help us by seeing those information in. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I've got a couple quick announcements, and then we'll dive right into f uh, the um, second half of our audit logging presentation and then open it up for the questions that come in through there. Uh, so first is that as we have been talking right now we have coming up the Alpha DevCon 2016 which includes a day of training beforehand. Uh, you can attend the training in conjunction with it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to alphasoftware.com Click on the Alpha DevCon 2016 here. You'll find all the information regarding it uh, in terms of how to register and how to attend, what's going to be there, the great speakers that we have lined up uh, with executive panels and case studies, enormous amount of great content. And if you go to the training section, you can sign up for our training. In fact, we just did a run through of the final product today. It's a mobile optimized phone application for field inspection. And uh, we're going to be putting the polishing touches on that. And it's really going to be great. I mean, basically, when you walk away from this training, you're going to walk away with a complete understanding of how to how the core structure of mobile optimized forms, the new generation of form technology, how to set it up, how to link it to data, how to link it to disconnected, how to operate disconnected, how to capture um, pictures, annotate things, uh, add your own controls in. I mean, it's a very, it's going to be an action packed day for sure. And we're very excited about that. And uh, we'll have an excellent presentation for you. So go to alphasoftware.com, Alpha DevCon 2006, make sure to sign up and also make sure to uh, sign up for the pre conference training day. So with that, um, I want to go ahead and dive in and continue our discussion from last week. Uh, before I do so, just a quick process check, Dave, to make sure everything's coming through okay. Audio is coming through, video is coming through. Excellent, excellent. Well, we started talking about this last week, and that's the idea of an audit trail. Specifically, how within the system can you track activity uh, that can be then used uh, in terms of um, finding out what happened. Uh, I kind of almost think of it as like the black box on a plane is that you always want that black box because that has a record of what happened. And this same thing, you'll have an audit trail so you can understand what happened. And we talked about, um, it's called many different things, audit logging, transaction log, security log, etc. But the core concept is recording activity on your server. And I really talked about there are really two kind of key areas 
uh, with two methodologies. One is that Alpha has built-in logging, and last week we walked through the different built-in logging capabilities, both uh, security logging that's enabled in our web security uh, uh, framework, and then also on the server itself, I went through a demonstration that talked about uh, how you can set up logging on the server. So it's logging uh, errors, uh, transactions, communications, etc. And there's an enormous amount of data there. One of the best parts of that is that if there is errors, it's tracking those errors. So you may not see something happening in your user interface on the on the web, desktop, web, or mobile, but there could be a failure happening in your code somewhere, and it's, it makes it much easier to identify. So if you are interested and you miss that, you can go to our uh, video library, and towards the end we'll show you where to find that, and we have last week's Q, uh, Alpha Weekly Q&A, and on there we go through in detail how to go in, activate those logging capabilities, and then um, get access to the data that actually was logged. Today I'm going to talk a little bit more about what you can do from a programming standpoint to enable deep, deep logging of activity in the system. And this is more the audit trail aspect of it, i.e. a person logs in, they go in, they modify a record. How do we have a history of that? How do we know who uh, changed things and also what they changed? And so I've come across a methodology. There are a couple different ways to handle this, but this is the one that I've settled on. And so I'm going to talk about that today. And really. Uh, you'll see I have alpha built-in logging, that was last week, and we have file logging and database logging. The idea is you can capture this data and either save it to a file on the hard drive on the server or into a database. It's really up to you. And today I'm going to be going in more detail of how to do the database logging, although uh, you can, uh, you know, obviously use the same techniques for file logging from that standpoint. So uh, what I call is kind of user-based logging or user logging is that uh, when someone does something, what you want to be able to do is then uh, extract that information and then write it to a source that you can review later. And the two sources that we talk about are a file log or a database log. Um, real quick, the key function to provide logging to a file is a built-in alpha xbasic um, command called save underscore, or as uh, someone likes to say, underbar to underbar file. And it's a very simple, very, very simple uh, command that basically takes a piece of text, and that could be small or large, it's up to you, it could be a variable, here I have an actual text, but that could be a variable. Then you have a file path that says where that's going to be saved. So in this case, I'm saving it into a folder on the F drive on the server. And then last but not least, you have a uh, switch that's defaulted to true, but I like to put it in there, that says whether the data should be appended to this file, to this particular file, or if this should be overwritten, so it should overwrite that file. And there's different reasons. With audit logging, obviously you want to be appending. You don't want to be overwriting your file because you'll lose the history there. But there's certain situations where you just want to capture a piece of text and you only want the last version of whatever happened. That you can put in here a false and it'll do that. So when you're doing file logging, and again, interpret what I show you today, you would merely take the text and other information you want to and then just insert it into a file. The other method is into database, and that's kind of the one I tend to use. And basically the way I've done it is I create a XBasic function, and I'm going to show you some of the, the information about that. Um, there's kind of two, there's, uh, and I'll go through it there, but into a database log, and that log is a real simple table that has an ID. This could be most likely an auto-incremented auto ID by the database itself. Includes a timestamp so you can tell when this log entry occurred. Uh, very important is I put in a user ID. I call it FK underbar user ID because it's a foreign key to my user ID. Uh, our user table where I'm tracking who people are. Now what's important about that and I like to stress is use the user ID and then do a foreign key relationship to who that person is. Don't use the username. Uh, I originally started doing that where I used their user um, name that they logged in with, you know, joe at joe.com or whatever it happens to be. Well the problem with that is over time their user ID may change. They may get a new email address. And so to keep kind of consistency in my logging, I always extract a, sort of like what their unique ID is in the database for that person and use that to store so that if I ever change their user name over time, I'll never sort of, I, I won't all of a sudden see a break where all of a sudden, oh wait, the name changed, what's going on? I can always relate it back to that same user. 
And last but not least is a text field, and this could be in the case of like SQL Server long text, in the case of, uh, out, you know, you want that uh, very large text field because it depends, most of the log entry is going to be small, but sometimes you may have a pretty significant amount of information being stored in there. And so that, and that's a very simple structure. You can add more fields, you can do, like I've seen where people add the IP address, uh, into there so they can trap what a IP address had occurred and Alpha has some basic functionality to give you that information but pretty stand for pieces there. Now so you can either go to a file where you're just saving this information to a file and you just create you know put in the user ID, the date, time uh, and then the information save it to the file and it just keeps appending it or you can use more of a database where you actually and the only thing with the database is you have to write that I usually set it up as a module where I pass in the, this information, I pass in the user ID and the text I want it to insert, and then my uh, uh, module or function takes that information and does the actual database insert into the database uh, from that standpoint. And there'll be some pros and cons. I mean, if your database goes down, you won't be able to do logging. Uh, file, usually the file system is always up, so it's maybe touch more reliable, but I found that databases these days are very, very sophisticated. Uh, a benefit of database logging over file logging is that now that it's in a database, I can create user interfaces on top of it. I can query that. I can do a lot more, you know, use the power of the database to kind of segment and grab that data in the, uh, in the, you know, and I can use searches and filters and things like that. So it's sort of whatever you personally choose. There's no right one. It's more of what you feel would be appropriate for solution. So that's sort of what I've set my logs up to be, but the real question is, well, how do I extract the information, specifically what the person has changed, and how do I save that to the database? So let me walk through a couple steps on how to do that and show you some sample pieces of code uh, to do that. The key aspect of all of this is in the UX control, and there are uh, similar kind of aspects in the grid control. I'm not going to cover that today because more and more people are using the UX control more for data editing versus a standard grid. Although, if someone is interesting or interested in this, please let us know at guides at Alpha Software and we do a quick session on uh, how to do this inside of a grid. Uh, but again, I'm going to focus on UX control today. Is the after dialog validate um, process. Now, about two months ago, I walked through sort of the life cycle of UX from when it opens up to when it gets closed, etc. And one of the key uh, server-side actions or server-side uh, positions is called after dialog validate. This is fired after the person has uh, basically entered data into a UX, hit a button, it's passed all the validation, that's i.e., like you've said, you know, these fields are required or this field has to be this or this or something along those lines. So it says, okay, everything's great about this UX. I have a set of data from the UX that I'm now ready to write to the database or wherever, and therefore it's ready to go. And that's where I put my code in here because I don't want to prematurely log things until I kind of have a good set of data to log. Because if the person like puts in a wrong value and the, the UX says, oh wait, you can't put in that value, that may not really be that important. I'm mainly just concerned with what they do put in the database not what they do want. And therefore, after dialogue is where I do those pieces. Now, to set all this up, as I've said, there's kind of two methods that you can use. And I'm going to focus now on the database method. Um, method. Method number one, which I find that's really, really handy, is that I actually have special fields in my database for each record that kind of hold the last change and last information of the change. Um, and then I also use code because then you can instantly pull up a record and find out who changed it, what was the last date and time that change, and what that change was. <clears throat> and then you can combine that with the audit logging where you fire off your command with that same information so you kind of update. So first what I want to do is show you how you can set it up so you can find that, you know, you can set up your database. So I'm going to go ahead and open in. This is a, a detail from my UX component. And this is a standard data bound UX component, meaning it's data bound to a specific table in my database there. And you'll notice that I've added, and this is kind of the background, this is a blow up of it. I've added three fields, and these fields are in my database. And that's the user GUI ID. In this case, this application, instead of calling it ID, they called it GUI ID. Um, then there's one called the text update log. This is where we're actually going to put what was changed. And we also track the IP address 
of when that change was done. And so I actually have these columns on every table in my database. And when I create a UX, I add these columns and I data bind it to the table. So the cool thing about this is very easy to do and what's nice is Alpha is going to handle most of the heavy lifting in terms of saving it. Now this is only going to save whatever the last change was. So therefore on this UX for that particular table, it, you know, it's going to continually overwrite this information. So it's good for like, hey, who was the last person who touched this record, would they change, etc. But then I use it in combination with that other methodology where I actually write the same information to another table and those. And I notice I'm missing one column here is uh, I also have, and I'm not showing here, but uh, the update date. So it shows actually the, the date in which it updated there. Now what I want to do is when the person clicks OK, the systems automatically data bound these fields. But the thing I have to do is before it's actually saved to the database, I actually have to write information into each of these locations. So I have to write who the user GUI ID is and those pieces there. And then when they hit save, I have to make sure that the UX then saves that information along with the other information in my UX. Because there's one important thing, and this is what I really want to stress in my discussion today, is that um, there's something called dirty fields and how alpha works. You have to kind of take our dirty columns and you have to take into account that. So again, take a step back just to make sure I'm clear. I have a UX here. In my database, I've added these columns into my database so I can track this information. I've placed those columns on there as text fields on my UX. I have data bound those, so those are data bound to the database so that when Alpha saves this UX, it's automatically going to take the information that's in those fields and put it into the database. And that's going to trap my last change on any record in the system. Now, this is really critical is that in that after dialog validate when the person clicks on there I am going to update this field information and then also tell the system that those fields have been updated so let me go ahead and go walk through it real quick first and foremost we have this concept of dirty fields now what I'm doing is excuse me <coughs> when I update those fields in after dialog validate and I'll show you a code in a few moments here What's going on is I'm setting the value of those fields, but the system doesn't know that those fields are dirty. It knows that if the user did it. So what's important is I have to tell Alpha, hey, you know, these fields that are on here, I've gone ahead and updated it. Make sure to include those in your update to the database. And then the other important aspect is I use a really cool, powerful technique to find out uh, from the e dot data submitted, this is all the data that has been submitted back from the UX. I extract out of there what has been changed or what was the previous value and the new value. So let me dive into code and kind of walk you through on how to go through this from that standpoint. So I'm in the alpha development environment and this is just an example and I've got, you'll notice I've got this saved and saved by here and then down here I have my hidden little uh, update log and IP address, etc. And I'm going to go over here to the server side events and go to the after dialog validate. Now there's a bunch of other stuff going on in here, but the important thing I want to go over is first and foremost is that I am going to add to uh, the um, system, I'm going to tell the system that uh, those three columns are what are called dirty columns here. So what I'm going to be doing, and let me, I'm, I'm a little bit confusing, I apologize, let me bear with me as I go through here, is that there is a command, there is a list that's automatically maintained by the system called e.dirtyColumns. And in that list, e.dirtyColumns, basically, here's the line that I want to show you right here, is that e.dirtyColumns is a list of columns in your UX i.e. fields that the user has modified. So the system is tracking this automatically. So the system sits there and goes, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to go ahead and track what columns have been changed by the user. So when I write the database to the database table, I'm only going to write the, t the columns or the fields that have been changed, which is a nice feature. The problem is you'll notice in here that I am changing the value of my update log, the user GUI ID, and the IP address, I am manually doing that in code here. That's not happening in the user interface. So if I don't actually tell the system that I'm about to modify these and that these fields have been modified, the system will save everything to the database but won't 
save any changes to those fields. So the idea behind it is I set the value of those hidden fields. So in this case, the text upload, update log, and I'll show you how I do this, is what I want to save as far as a description of what has changed. I'm putting in this case the user GUI ID there, and then the IP address, and then what I'm doing, which is super important right here, is I'm saying, okay, take the e.dirty columns and add the names of those fields that I want to save, the update log, the GUI ID, and the IP address. And what that then does is tell the system, okay, not only save the fields that have been changed by the user, so all these fields up here, but also these hidden fields that I've manually put together, please also save those too. And that's super critical, and I know I've spent a little time on it, but what's important is you could set the value of these fields and then, you know, go ahead and say, you know, execute server-side action to save the data, and you're like, well, wait a minute, that data is not in the database, what happened? Well, since you did that manually in code, you have to set the e dot dirty, dirty columns. So that's number one. So what I'm doing is when the user saves this, I am setting all these columns to be dirty and then updating them and then therefore when the data is saved to the database. Now here is the real magic in terms of how I come up with what has changed in the system. So uh, in alpha, again, you have a lot of information that's coming back from the uh, form as to what has changed. And one of the most important ones on here is something called e.data submitted, okay? So what I wanna do is, and you'll see how I'm kinda of working this, is that I am actually looking at e.dirty columns, because remember, e.dirty columns is handled by alpha, and what happens is when a person edits a field, the, the UX form says, oh, this person edited this field, I'm going to add that field to my dirty columns. So therefore, I immediately have a list of columns that I can uh, determine what have been changed by the user. And that's often what's important. What I care about is what's been changed, not if they've kept it the same. So basically, I create a little for loop where I go through each of those dirty columns I use a technique to grab what the new value is, what the old value was, and then I append it to my log text, which is just a variable of the name of the dirty column, the old value and the new value, and therefore I'm kind of building up a little text string saying, here are the dirty columns that have been changed and this is what they were and what they aren't. So let me walk you through in detail. So the first thing it's doing is it's looking at my list of dirty columns here. And it's saying for each item name. So therefore, it's gonna loop through each of those fields that have changed. Then I'm using a really powerful technique called evaluate, where basically I'm dynamically building up, saying give me the e .data submitted of that name. So let's say it was like a uh, social security number. Well, that's not a good one. Maybe say it's address. So I'm saying e .data submitted that address put into item value the new. So the system will automatically combine that and create that uh, command. I'm doing the same thing here where I'm saying give me the old data and put that into the old value. And then I create a little piece of text that says here's the name of the field, here's the new value with some text in between and the old value. So I'm building up my log text. So it's going to go through, if I had 100 fields, it's going to spin through this um, routine right here and add a hundred different or however many they changed and then what I do is I go through and then update that put that text into that one field tell it that hey I want you to save that field and then I do a execute server side of save action data so again what this is going to do is go through each field that's changed extract the old and the new value build some log text to be saved then what it's going to do is go down here and insert that information along with any other data I want to trap, and then it's going to set those columns to be dirty so that when the save occurs, it's going to pick up and make sure to save those fields I've adjusted manually. Now, it's not showing right here, but I would also put in here the data or the trigger to then say, take this same information and write it to my audit table. And again, I don't have that in here because they just wanted to have the last change on each record. But in here, you would basically have a little, you would call an XBasic function that would take those three values and insert them into that audit table there. But the real magic here is the combination of being able to determine what has changed, extracting the new and the old, and then once you've done that, is putting that information into the fields and then setting the dirty columns 
to then um, make sure that the system saves that inter information to the database. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to be a database for the audit log. I could take this log text right here, add the username ID, the IP address, the date and time, and use that save to file function to append it to a text file just as easily as sending it to there. And the speed is very, very quickly. But again, I'm doing this all in the after dialog validate before I actually save the data to the database because it gives me those hooks to go in and find out what's changed, extract the changes, and then save those into the proper fields there. So in the after dialog, I first I find out, I'm, I guess actually it should be extranged uh, there. And then let me write this here. I'll go first, what are the dirty fields? Second, extract the fields with E dot there. And then set hidden fields to dirty. And then save UX. So how it works is that I, I found out what are the dirty fields, what have been changed. I extract the changes using the E dot say it's submitted. And then what I do is I uh, set the hidden fields to dirty so that I know those new fields where I'm tracking that change is. And then I save the UX data and that saves it to there. So what this allows me to do, which is very powerful, is that I have my server-based logging, kind of watching alpha, seeing if there's errors, etc. But with this technique is that in each UX, I can extract what fields have changed, find out their previous and their new value, put that into a, a value. I can either save it back into the field, which you saw today, or what I can do is put that into another database uh, you know, table by inserting it into that. Or last but not least, you could actually save it to a text file on the hard drive, which will then there. The only thing I, I'm a little concerned about hard drives is that, you know, that file is going to grow very quick, very big, very quickly if you have a high transactional volume. So managing it may become a little bit more problematic. But those are the methods. So you really have two methods in which you can do audit trails. Is uh, first is with the built-in logging, and the other is its combination of either a file or database log using the methodology of finding out what has changed, saving it either in the record itself or to an external log file. Again, just to go back, this was the method for this solution where I had built-in fields to track those changes. The reality is you don't even have to do that. That was just something that was needed for this requirement. You could go through here, let me go to my server side. Once you have your log text, you don't really have to set those fields and set the dirty columns. You could just literally call out to your, and save that data into the secondary table. Um, the benefit of this is you can always pull up a record and immediately find out who was the last person who touched it and what did they change. So that's kind of handy and people tend to like that from that standpoint there. So that's a quick and dirty overview of how to do that. You can get far more sophisticated than what I've done, but I find that, you know, keeping it simple, keeping it to really what people have touched, what they've changed. You could actually, with like HIPAA compliance and other capabilities like that, you could actually add in code where if someone looks at a record, you could save to a database table uh, who that person is, the date and time, and what record they looked at. So there's a lot of capabilities using the server side events. So in my case, I focused on the after dialog validate, but you could easily put a little piece of code in the on dialog initialize which is going to fire every time someone hits that dialog. In there, you could put something equivalent where you just trap the person's information and then you insert that someone opened up this UX with this unique record ID from, say, the customer table or the patient record table or something like that. And that's all done by adding code into these server side events. And they're very, once you've added the code, then it's kind of copy paste to each one because a lot of the things like, you know, e dot dirty columns, E dot data submitted, that's going to be the same on every one. And again, there's equivalent methodologies in the grid area. I, I, we don't have time to walk through that. But if people are really interested, we could go through a sample of how to trap changes on a grid when someone updates a record or something along those lines, if so desired. So that's server side logging or audit trail logging. Again, use either the alpha built in for like especially security and error trapping and things like that. For more defined requirements as far as audit logging or trails, uh, you would then use by adding code to either UX or grid 
in the server side events so you can trap that information from there. Um, I haven't gone over mobile capabilities. Part of the issue with mobile is that obviously you may be disconnected, so it's a bit more complicated, but you can use a very similar method, meaning that you can literally have a hidden list on your mobile device that's disconnected and be inserting records into that using JavaScript and then syncing that information back to the database. But again, way beyond the scope of our time we have available. Um, so if people, you know, the, you can do it with both from that standpoint there. So that is audit trails, a quick and dirty introduction. Questions that anybody has or I might be able to help out with, uh, let me know or questions on other subjects, you just let us know. Great. Well, a couple questions on the on the current subject. Um, the first yes. one is, um, how do you handle null values? For example, the old data field was blank and the new data field I put something in. In XBasic, does that come across as a null or does that come across just as like quote, quote? Yeah, it comes across as a second. It's, it's treated as an empty string inside XBasic. Okay. So there's no like special null K. You don't, yep. you don't have to do anything special in XBasic to, to say. No, what will happen is when you return the old value, it's gonna return as uh, an empty string. Yep. And therefore, what you could do is that this code right here, old, you could say, you know, if uh, item val value old is equal to this, then item value old is equal to, and this is just text, null. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I could actually modify what it says instead of just putting a blank in here. It can then say, okay, item value new previous item is just text, and it would say null. Um, so that's how you can handle that. And you're just looking, it'll return an empty string as what will return uh, from the old dot data submitted. You won't get a special null type value that's associated with it. Okay, gotcha. Uh, next question, and if actually if you could jump back into the code there. Oh, sure, sure. Um, someone indicated that they wanted to also, sure they're interested when it's changed, but they're also interested in the create date and the create user. And I think I saw that your code does uh, handle yes. that. Actually, I do that really simply. Let me show you how I do that. Okay. In my form, you'll see I've got fields here for created, created by, saved, saved by. Well, if you look at created, um, what I and then created by, um, if I'm not mistaken, I set that um, in my on dialog validate. Let me see. This one's a little bit. Okay. Here's where I do that. So what I do is I use a command called e.control and then the name of it. So for instance, in this e.control created, which is the created date, I insert the value of now. In e.createdBy, by, and you can see I, this is an old system, so I'm using username. Again, use the unique ID. But you'll notice I'm also setting the created by to be a session variable that I trap when the person logged in. So most likely what I would say is a session dot user ID versus username. And you know, up to you um, that you could put that. And you'll notice also I have a org ID for this record, uh, which is what organization they're with. This happens to be a multi-tenant structure. So what I do is I save in there automatically whatever the organization ID is. So when it saves this record, I know that it's it's you know, going to be part of this uh, organization that's in the system from that standpoint. So all you do is in the on dialog initialize, you can set the value of any of the controls on the interface using e dot control dot and then the name of the field, and that's pretty easy from that standpoint there. Excellent. Um, let me see what else I've got here. This is a question about drop-down boxes, and the question uh -huh. is as follows. Um, if you have a drop-down box and you want to store a numeric value, but you want to display a text value, how do you go about doing that? Interesting, yep. Um, so you want to have a drop-down box, and mm -hmm. you want to show a alphanumeric, but store so a numeric. So maybe your three choices in the drop-down box were like cars, buses, and okay. trucks but he wants to resolve to one, two, and three. Gotcha, no problem. So let me go ahead and go into my demo so I don't screw anything up here. And I'll go ahead and just open up one of my existing UXs. So for people who are new, I'm in the alpha uh, development environment. On the left are all my different control types and the center is kind of the layout of my controls and on the right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over here to and insert 
a drop-down box. And I'll just call this drop-down box test. So in here, I've got a drop-down box. Um, and, you know, if I run this, then it would just show that. So what we do is when you have a drop-down box, you'll notice that we have drop-down box properties over in the properties area. And you have something called choices. And that's where you define what will populate that drop-down box. So to access that, you could click the ellipsis button right here. And there are a couple different ways you can do it. You can either use static information, dynamic, or variables. Let me walk you through the first two here. For static, the way you handle it, and there's a little instruction up here. So uh, let's say it's uh, fast is zero, uh, medium is one, and slow is three. So what this is saying is that this is the text that will be displayed in the drop-down box. The pipe character is a separator, and then it's saying whatever's after the separator is what will actually be the value of that drop-down box. So from a computer standpoint, it's going to say, I don't care what's displayed, I'm using that second one to save into the database or take action on, etc. So again, it's a piece of text to display. Then you have a, um, a pipe character and then also then the, um, the actual value, in this case, the numeric value here. So that's how you would do it in a manual standpoint. And so when this is displayed, you would see fast, medium, slow, and you'd see value. And one of the cool things is that if you were to set the default value, say, to be 1, the system is smart enough that when it shows the person this UX, it's going to show um, the, uh, the text medium on that drop-down box because it says, oh, you set the value to 2. Well, that uh, value of 2 is this display name, and it shows that display name from there. Now, this works fine if you have a static list that will never change in time, but reality is that, you know, you're probably going to want to make that data-driven. So in doing so, you then can click the dynamic methodology here. You'll notice a bunch of things have changed real quick. So what we're going to use is the data source in this case uh, is going to be alpha DAO, meaning we're going to read it from a database. I can then select my connection string, which is the pointer to where my data is. And so my primary one, CONN. Okay. Now what I can do is now that I've selected that, I can say, okay, I want to actually talk to the database and find out what I want to use. So you'll notice I then it's asking me, well, where, what table should I look up these drop-down values? So I'm going to go ahead and go into, say, um, products. Okay. So I've got a products table. And you'll notice that I have a field to display. This is what's going to be shown to the user. So I'm going to call it product name. Now I could go ahead and save that. And what would happen is the drop-down box, when it's set to, say, a product name, would just be a product name. But what we want to do is more powerfully is we want to store a value, as you asked, uh, other than the display value. So I click on that button there. I go to product ID. Now what's going to happen is that the user will see product name, but the database or the alpha system will actually store the product ID to it. And I can display a value for node selection, etc. So I can click over here. So let me go ahead and show you what that looks like real quick. So give me a moment here. I'll go into working preview. Okay. And so I, there we go. So now you'll notice I have a drop down box. And you'll notice that I have from the database a list of all of the different um, products. So I can select that product. And the user is seeing this name, but the reality is behind the scenes, the value of this is a whatever it is. So to actually demonstrate that, let me go ahead and put a button in here. And then I'm just going to do a, a show value. Actually, you know what I'm going to do even more interesting here is I'm going to put in a text box here, and I'll call this display value. Okay, so I've got my drop-down box and my display value here, and I'm going to use a real neat little trick called calculated field expression. And what I want to do is when the person selects something from test, I want to show what the value of test is. So I'm going to go to select display value, Go to my properties here, go to find calculated field expression, and in there all I'm going to just do is insert my test field, 
So now whatever the value of this is will be displayed here. So let's go back in here and we'll show you this is kind of a quick and dirty way to show you how it's actually trapping and tracking the person's uh, there. So you'll notice that this has been selected Gorgonzola Tolino and you'll notice that's the product ID for that. If I change it, you'll notice that Alice Mutton is 17. Chang is 2. Now, you don't, obviously, this record here is saying 2. This is just for display purposes. So if I were to data bind this to my database, when the database, or when the alpha system saved this, it would actually save into the database that value, not the letter. So you have a foreign key relationship between, say, your orders and the product table. You want to save in the orders the unique ID of that product, not the name of that product, because who knows, they could edit that name later on. That's how you do it. So again, this is for display only, but as you can see, it's displaying textually some items, but then the reality is the true value of this uh, control is the unique ID. And again, the way we set that up in this case is we went to choices up here, and we created we a we linked to the products table, displayed the product name, and stored the product ID. So that's kind of a quick and dirty overview of how to use drop down boxes to and you could either do it again as I showed you statically if you're not going to change things a whole lot, you know, that's fine. The only downside is whenever you change it, you have to republish your application. Whereas this, if I added a new product, boom, it would just show up in that drop down list. Excellent. So let's take the drop down thing even farther. Uh, take and it up a notch. We're going to kick this one up a notch. So that so uh, someone asked, okay, that's great, but let's just say I did have a drop down box like that. It was like blue is what is one and white is number two. And when I choose blue, it saves it as one. When I choose white, it saves it as two. Later on, when I'm going to go back to the auditing thing that you were talking about later ah. on. I'm going to look at those numbers, one and two, and say, I have no idea what that means. How would you put gotcha. it, How would you log that in a way that might be more friendly to someone who's trying to make sense of those logs? Yeah, the, um, what you're going to have to do is in your logging procedure, uh, you're going to have to look up the, the human readable name. Um, there's really not a trick that I'm aware of where you can pick up in the after dialogue validate the, the name on that control because it only knows the data value there. So the tricky part is that, yeah, for that kind of scenario, you're going to have to write a, a quick little routine that looks up in the other one. Now, let me show you a cool command that allows you to do that. And I've just happened to have it in my, so this is just my X basic functions here and this is just to show you the code. But I'm going to right click here go to code library, which we've done a demonstration of how to use code library. This is where I save snippets of code, and I have one called SQL Lookup. And this is the SQL Lookup, and it's a very nice little piece of code, ideal for this kind of thing. So um, what it does is that basically you tell it the connection string, so it knows where to, what database to look it up in. You tell it what product, what, uh, in this case, let's say it's products, is the table I'm looking up the information in. The result I want is product name, and then I can set a filter where I can say um, product ID is equal to e dot data submitted dot product ID, and then I can say the product name is equal to this. Okay, so this is a neat little piece of code that can help you out. So what I can do is, it's called a SQL lookup. Basically, I tell it what database, what table to look in, what I'm looking for in that table. So in this case, the, the, the result expression is I want to get back the product name. Then I'm giving it the filter. Well, great, you want to go to the products table, you want the product name back. Well, how should I figure out which one you want? Well, simple. You just put in a, and actually that was incorrect, product ID is equal to um, e dot data submitted. So e dot data submitted product ID is what is going to come back from that drop down box. So actually it'd be like deep drop down box test, whatever I called that control. So that's going to bring back the one, two, five, whatever it happens to be. So now I can say product ID is equal to five. And then there, when it does this command SQL lookup, it takes all of this information here 
does it and returns whatever that value is that came back from the database. So in this case, it says, oh great, I'm going to look up in the products table, I'm going to look up the product that has a product ID equal to 5, and I'm going to give you back the product name. And once that's done, you have that product name, now you can use that in your logging routine to change it from a product name. So for something like that, you're going to have to add a little extra code, but once it's up and running, it goes. And it doesn't add, and these, these um, SQL lookups are very fast, so really don't, the user really will see an imperceptible uh, impact to the performance on what's going on from there. But I really like the SQL lookup. It's a very powerful command and uh, easy to use, and um, you can just put it anywhere you want, and you don't have to write big, long, amounts of X basic code to call the database and set up a SQL query. One little trick though, and this I like to tell everybody, is that you'll notice I'm filtering here product ID is equal to there, because I know it's a number. So it'll rent it to be like product ID is equal to 5. But let's say you had, um, you were looking up product IDs were, new, uh, were uh, alphanumeric. So let's say product ID is equal to XYZ001. Well, the problem is this needs to be a SQL statement, so that would fail because it wouldn't understand it because you really need to have the single quotes around that. So the way you do that is you go add those single quotes into your, um, your filter function so that when it actually builds this filter, it includes my single quotes so that you get this result so that when the, because it's looking for a SQL statement, a SQL compliant uh, filter statement. So, you know, tricky part is just remember, if you're doing numerics, you don't need the quotes. If you're doing alphanumeric checks, you have to put in, you know, these single quotes so that when it renders that complete filter, its product ID is equal to the text inside those, and then it runs correctly. If you don't do that, you'll, this will fail, and it, it will give you a failure because it will say that's not an appropriate filter because, you know, it's text and I don't have those single quotes. So I like to throw that in there just so people know that when you build this filter right here, make sure that this filter is SQL compliant, meaning that it's going to work properly in SQL because that's what this, this command is basically taking and passing that along as a SQL, it's building a SQL query behind the scenes for you so you don't have to do it. So it makes it a little simpler and faster. So again, check out, it's called SQL lookup. And by the way, you're looking for that, go to help, open documentation. It'll take you to our fabulous new documentation. Go SQL, go to the search section, go SQL lookup. Bingo. Hyper seconds later, goes through and talks about, gives you an example, shows you how to build different types of it, shows you how you can use arguments. It's, it's really very powerful. So again, highly recommend that you use our new documentation because you're going to see extensive documentation on everything this happens to uh, do. And, you, you know, SQL lookup can get pretty, you can put in their uh, concat states. You can do a lot of things with it, to, and it can be very powerful as a, in your toolkit um, in terms of, because right now, if you'll notice in here, I'm just returning back the field, but I could put something like concat, and this is SQL land um, product price, and what this would do is bring back a connect, you know, this is a SQL command that would bring back concatenation of the product name and maybe uh, a dash and the product price. That's what would be brought back. So you can do some very sophisticated kind of uh, uh, things inside here. It's a very flexible function. But again, just look in the documentation for SQL lookup and that should answer. And I apologize, that was a bit of a probably a long-witted response but you're going to be responsible for translating that unique ID back into English, and when you do, then obviously you can use SQL Lookup to hopefully save yourself some time and energy to do that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another, uh, you had spoke before a little bit about performance, how this, this particular function runs really fast, but someone was asking just in general about the after dialog validate script. Uh, if you have large records that have like 50 or more fields, is it going to be a huge performance hit? Uh, maybe not for doing a lookup on each one, but uh, to do the type of tracking that you were talking about before, uh, or is know, it fairly quick? It's extremely quick, and here's the reason why, is that um, just kind of a little bit background is, let me find my fabulous here, okay, no, nope, that's uh, not the one, ah, oh, there we are, okay, so 
what, what's going on here is that after dialog validate, very, very important, is a server side event, meaning that after dialog validate is executed on the server. So the form is filled out here and then the form with all that data is submitted to the server. Then it's all over on the server. So therefore it's all inside their hardware. And what I've determined is that the lag time of communicating between here is really your key aspect. The amount of time it takes to gather that data, send it to the alpha server. The alpha server then does what it needs to do and then sends it back. So adding a few more SQL lookups or a few other things on the server side really don't add a lot. Now if you have like someone doing, you know, 100,000 transactions per second, yeah, you're going to have to look at maybe there's ways of caching that data in memory instead of doing database lookups or things like that. But what I find is the communication of sending and receiving the result back usually overwhelms any kind of time allocated on the server side. And the nice thing is that that's all pretty much so almost in memory. I mean, especially with modern databases, if you're doing that lookup every time, then the SQL database is going to be caching those kind of queries. So the next time you need it, it it's like literally gives you the information in just a very short period of time. So, uh, you know, I really haven't seen much of an impact because the amount of time it takes for the web browser to send the information then for alpha, you know, because alpha has to do two things. One is that it's doing the after dialog validate and then what it's doing is rendering any commands in X and HTML and stuff to send back to the client side to update the visual representation on the client side to show the person that it's been updated either by displaying a wait uh, you know a uh, con confirmation message or thing like that it's that sending that data over usually is much more than the actual calculation time on the server especially with modern servers uh, there's so much cache in these things that almost all of the activities going on especially the code parts is happening in memory in cache on the processor and so it's just nanoseconds of time to be able to do things along those lines. So it's a good question. And as your transaction volumes grow, um, you know, you're going to have to look at that. But one of the benefits of the server side is that, especially now with the Alpha Cloud, is that the systems can dynamically scale up and add more processors as you need it, especially with IIS and the server Alpha Cloud, is that if all of a sudden you're starting to see that you're getting some slower response times here, you can scale up your, you can throw hardware at it and it's going to work really, really quickly. On all the solutions I've used this, I've seen zero problems, you know, meaning I haven't seen a perceptible slowdown in the operation of my forms. They come back just as fast as they did without that code in it. And actually a, a real way, good way to do that is go ahead and take one of your UXs, write some of the sample code, um, run it um, and then come in here and highlight or comment out the um, the commands and then run it again from the user standpoint, i.e. time it in the browser and my feeling is you'll see almost zero difference between the two uh, because all of that is just in memory hardcore processing that processors most times they're sitting there waiting to do stuff anymore so that but again if you're concerned go ahead and write a sample code on one of your UX's to do that logging um, and then turn it off uh, run it track the time and then turn it off uh, to do that and there's some really powerful tools out there that allow you to you know monitor how long does it take for a query from the web browser to go to the server and back you can actually track it down almost to the nanosecond in terms of how fast that's going um, like, in fact, let me show you something kind of cool. Do you mind if I dive into something kind of interesting? I use, yeah. uh, let me go back. Yeah, okay. Um, about that, and it's kind of an offshoot, but let me go ahead and go to an example system here. Uh, let's go there. This is an online system that I have here. Log in there. Do, 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 do. So let's go to action. Okay. Okay, so I've got a grid here, and I'm going to go in here, and this is using some logging and things like that. So I've got this here. I have a tool that I use on called Firebug, and it's a free tool for, in this case, I'm using Mozilla. And what this does, which is really cool, is that it, it basically is like a little debugging console. So let's say I want to go in here, and I've got my... Uh, my record here and let's say I'm just going to put a period to the end here and I'm going to click save. Well you'll notice that 
notice what happened here is that I had, uh, it actually shows me my post command. This is the command that takes all of this form, sends it to the server, and then when it comes back, actually updates the user interface after that's been done. And you'll notice something pretty cool is that this is showing me how long it took in time, 2.34 seconds, for it to gather all the data, send it to the server, modify it, and send it back. So let's say I go here and click Save again. You'll see, wow, check that out. Notice this. My first time was 2.34 seconds. My second time was 1.1 seconds. Let's go ahead and do this. And now I'm down to one second. That's probably the best I'm going to get. So there's some really nice tools out there, and Firebug is one of them, that allow you to kind of watch what's going on inside your browser. And in this case, it's actually not only giving me what happened, you'll see in here, that it's showing me exactly what was going on, the JavaScript that was run, the post transaction that was sent back to it, and then it also gives me some little nice uh, uh, performance data right in there so I can see, well, how fast is that running? So as I was mentioning before, go in, disable that um, the there, come back, probably for fairness sake, close your browser and reopen it and see what this time is. And my guess is it's going to be off by just a very, very little, a perceptible amount compared to the overall amount of time it takes for the system to send data back and forth from the server. So again, this is called Firebug. It's available for free from you just have to go and install it as an instant. And what's nice too is this is also will throw out any errors. So if there's any JavaScript errors, and I mainly get those in security and other areas, then I'm going to send, see those here. And in fact, this is a test system to be honest. So let me see if I can see any errors here that are going on here. Um, let me go ahead and reload this. Uh, this is on my test server here. And so, um, no, not showing in there, but uh, so I fixed it, which is good. But if you have any JavaScript errors, any problems, they'll show up here. Whereas when you're running it right here, you may not actually see a JavaScript area. So uh, something to look up there. So that's the concept of, um, uh, again, uh, two things. One is I don't think you're going to see a big performance hit. And two, to really determine it, put together a sample, use something like Firebug or uh, Google's development tools, and actually run a transaction real world and see what the difference is uh, in terms of time. And I, I'm almost guaranteeing you that um, we are not going to see a big difference in performance between the two. Excellent. Thank you. Here's kind of a neat question. Uh, this person wants to run different JavaScript, depending on whether the app is served from their local test server or whether it's on their main production server. Hmm. And what they're wondering is, how do they find out the name of the server that the ah. app is running on? Yep. There's a, a something called the request object, and this one you should be get familiar with it. The request object is um, everything about the communication between the client and the server. So when that post, like I showed you a few moments ago, when I hit enter, it basically bundled everything up and did a post transaction to the server. And the server said, oh, look, I've got this thing. And then it does what it, excuse me, needs to do and then sends the result back. Well, all of that information is in what's called the request object. And in the request object, you can find out many, many different information. You, you can basically get the raw request, which would tell what server it called, because each server is going to have a different, maybe a different IP address, or if they're on the same IP address, if you have two servers running, they're going to be on different ports. So you can literally take the request information, say the request headers here, and out of the request headers, you can grab the server information, what IP address it is, what port. And from there, that information is available in XBasic to then say, do XYZ. Now, in terms of JavaScript, that runs on the mobile device, not or on the, the client, not on the server. So this is where I would be able to take different actions based on what's going on there. Uh, in terms of if you were going to run different JavaScript on the mobile, what you need to do is trap when the person puts in that URL, trap with that URL and understand, oh, that is uh, the IP address for my production, run this JavaScript. But that's got to be handled all on the client side in JavaScript. Uh, but if you really just want to take different behaviors, depending on which server you're on, then you can use the request object on the server to say, okay, I got this request. 
uh, who's it from and what, which, you know, where am I running? Because then it understands, oh, I'm running on the production server and this request is for the production versus the validation. That's where you would handle it there. So again, if you're going to do stuff on the, on the client, you're going to have to trap what that URL is that they logged onto the server. And then within the JavaScript on the client is have if statements to decide which, you know, which uh, JavaScript to run. If you're on the server side, you can use the request object to then determine what is that incoming request. From that, you know what server you're running on. And from there, you could then say, okay, send this JavaScript back to the, you know, if you're doing like a callback, you can say, okay, send this JavaScript back uh, along with my message to the client because I know I'm running in production versus there. So I hope that kind of gives you some pointers on how to understand what, uh, you know, what environment you're running on live and in production. That's great. Well, we are out of time. Uh, here's a good question for next time, though. Just someone was asking about whether or not Alpha Anywhere has any functions to help you in creating XML files. And I believe that uh, yes, it, all kinds of good things. There's some parsers on there for sure. Let me check in terms of creating XML files. Yes, I think there is some kind of interesting things you can use to create XML files. There is indeed. Uh, and just one last really quick question I know we can answer is uh, you, you were referring to Firebug. They just wanted to know what browser was that that you're using it with? Oh, that was... Uh, um, I know Firefox is one of them, but yes, Mozilla is... Yeah. Firefox. So the Firebug product is uh, part of um, um, uh, Mozilla. Fire, Mozilla, yeah, Firefox. Yeah, so you go to... Uh, its own uh, debugger. I think it's add-ons. And then here you can say, you know, Firebug, and uh, you can get an add-on in here, and, uh, you know, and it's a very popular, well-supported. I mean, Firebug is like, every time they make a modification, that's the one that gets updated, uh, just because it's used by so many programmers and other people to see what's going on behind the scenes. Very, very powerful. What's cool, too, about Firebug, just to show you real quick, or real quick, is that not only do I have a console showing what's going on, but I have what's called an inspector where I can go in here and look at this. And you'll notice down here, it shows me the actual HTML. So request object here is in an H1. And then it shows me any like JavaScript and uh, CSS and everything else that's associated. So I just click this little inspector and I can go over each one of these things and I can actually see the underlying HTML and everything else that's been rendered by the browser. Uh, and I can then, you know, so I can see, oh, look, it's it's using a, a specific class here, property read write, uh, you know, it, so you can inspect things very easily without having to go in and actually say, you know, the other method would just be to say, you know, view page source and dig through it. This is much quicker to be able to just say there and say, okay, I want to see what that is right there. Point to what you want to see. see. Yeah. Yep, you'll notice it's an A tag. It's got an href of this, and uh, it's using a class of leaf is the specific class for there. So really handy tools that are available for it. And you notice here, check this out, over here it's actually showing me the style for that class. So it's inheriting that style from that leaf. And so this is it. That's uh, list style, outside, none, none. That's, uh, you know, that's the style that CSS. So you can reverse engineer CSS pretty easily using this tool. That's great. Thank you very much. We are over time. Uh, if you're looking for a copy of this or previous recordings, you should find it at videos.alphasoftware.com. If you have any problems locating the videos or you have questions that you would like us to address in the next session, please send an email to guides, G-U-I-D-E-S, at alphasoftware.com, and we'll be happy to help you out. So, Dan, thank you very much for presenting. I'd like to thank, thank everyone you. for asking questions and for attending today. Hope to see you at a future webinar. Take care and goodbye.